All right, so back to Kuba Ross. So like I said, give yourselves a chance to finish healing because we've got a lot to do and we're gonna have some new um, things to do from the federal level all the way down to the local level. And so we'll be um, pretty busy for the next six months. Okay. And then the other thing that I want you to uh, embrace is that we didn't kill seniors like um, you know the news and the federal government likes to think we did. It was not us. And um, for those of us that was able to nurture staff and help them grow, they've grown more than they know. And for those that have left, they're starting to filter back in because one of the things that we identified is most of the workers in our industry are people first and um, process second or manufacturing second. And so Amazon is laid off, FedEx is laid off, um, Walmart is um, laying off and then gonna rehire some of their people for seasonal. So I think we're gonna see some of our workers trickle back over and we're gonna have to fast track them back on um, and figure out how to do that. There is, um, if anybody's brave enough and wants to apply for a grant from HICPUF to be a formal trainer for direct care force workers, um, that, um, was, that RFP is out there if you're interested in looking at it. So all I want you guys to remember is that we're in it together. The more we do together, the more that we partner together. Um, it's not competition of filling units. It's actually partnering and having a voice and building a new voice so that we are um, not bifurcated all over the freaking place. All right, there, um, Kala is having a, um, convention uh, next uh, in two weeks from now. And every week they publish something called Tuesday Tidbits. And the lady that does it is a nurse. She runs a company called Wildflower. Her name is Nicole. And her specialty and her mother's specialty, I've known her mom for a long time, is on traumatic brain injuries. So Nicole is um, putting things out there every week and then a little hint about how to cope with it. And so we're working together, our agency and them, uh, we're working together to try to, uh, again, improve communication, improve relationships. So if you can go to the convention on the 12th, I'll see you there. We're going to be there. Um, and it'll be the first thing I've done out in the community in a long time. So some unannouncement, um, just to catch you folks that are on right now, um, this will come back at the end. Um, as I said, I'm launching a memory care community and I'm going to see if there is value in it and what we can do together. Um, and it's very selfish in a lot of ways. It's a lot of federal noise is coming our way and um, especially in the beginning of next year and how memory care is gonna look in the future and whether or not nursing homes are gonna stay in the business at all um, is kind of up in the air as the nursing home industry is under huge pressure. And so they are looking at their business units and some of, the, as some of the facilities across the country are going to turn into rehab and short stay, which means under 30 days. So I think it's going to be uh, a blessing to our, our business models and that we can match people and do short programs or do long programs, depending on the need, which is very person centered. So um, we'll come back to that at the end of the, those of you that can stay. Okay. So first thing first, Senate Bill 22154. This project just started. It just launched in September at the health department. And so we're in the middle of the legislation looking at it. And one of the things we identified right away is changing how we admit people. So you have to use the Colorado statue for the financial part. It is in um, stone. They have built a form, just use their form. The regulations and the statute is very clear. And then if you have somebody that doesn't pay, um, their bill, you can give them a 10 day quit notice, or you can take them to eviction court for non payment, which takes it out of the hands of the department um, and will help sometimes because I've been in situations where the family refuses to pay or is taken off with the money. I had one situation where the lady took off with the money and went overseas. And then I was scrambling trying to pay it all up because we did do the 10 day eviction. So it's going, so this is going to be an important um, opportunity in the industry is that we split this up into two pieces. 
The second part of this is going to be a very robust admission um, assessment. It's going to be the more um, the better that you match from the front end, the easier it's going to be um, to take care of that resident, to blend them into your community, and then hopefully catch behaviors before they come. Because here's where the legislators are have taken a very strong stance saying, we want the health department to approve all discharges for behaviors. And there's gonna be a very long process and the department could drag it out for months and you could, you could possibly not be paid during that process. So again, looking at residents, and the first thing you have to say to yourself is, why do you need to live in assisted living? What's going on in your life? And right now I can say in the Denver area for sure, um, we don't have enough people working in the community, home and community-based services to meet the needs of the people. And they're just, um, the seniors are unraveling. And I've got four or five on my desk right now that all need to go into assisted living, but they're on that gray zone of whether it's gonna be if assisted living can work or whether they need to go into skilled care. Um, I was talking to Eileen just before this meeting, I think a new faucet of the industry will be a semi-skilled pro program with CNAs and not our workers, but CNA workers providing the services um, for ambulatory folks that have need a higher level than what our programs were originally built for. So uh, I'm really, um, interested to see what's going to happen with this and if we can meet that need and if we can actually thrive and be better than anybody anticipated. So instead of um, fighting with them over this, we're going to turn and we're going to meet them head on and see what we can do to sway it our direction instead of their direction. Um, the other thing, there's a great article out and I have a, I've, a few of you, I've put it in the mail already, especially for memory care, um, and I'm glad to send it to you. Often came up with this incredible program that I took uh, Monday, and it's called Questioning Capacity. Let me show you here if I can get it in the camera correctly. Questioning Capacity by Optum. And this guy, this attorney, um, is an elder law attorney and he represents the Brookdales. And so this whole class is on and making ethical healthcare decisions. And this comes down to when do families get a person to sign a durable power of attorney? If it is after diagnosis of dementia, it will not hold up in court. And so that more and more guardianships are gonna be needed. The issue with guardianship court is they're going to have to find, or they're going to have to really make the process super simple to do emergencies and, um, and have really good training classes for families. Because I've been through this before where a probate court gave this blanket permission and the family took their loved one's civil rights away. And um, it was not a good thing. Um, not for, and it was definitely not person-centered and the lady didn't need to her rights to be taken away. She needed memory care, but not locked memory care. So we're gonna have some very interesting um, cases come forward. And that's part of what this memory care group is about is to start putting together that and proposing what we can or cannot do. So if you have a referral from another agency and they say, you know, uh, we can't meet this person's needs, hint, 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 stop and get them to talk to you. Uh, it's not an employment thing. It's actually a transfer of care and say, what were the barriers? What were you guys experiencing? And you get a way out in your staffing in your facility. Can you actually take care of it? So what I suspect is we're gonna have a fairly sizable amount of residents across the state that are gonna hit this door. And then the single entry points, um, because HCBS has already started to work on it. And so the single entry points in HCBS state and HCBS federal, um, they put this in our face where they're saying, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to ask mother's permission to discharge this person on behaviors. Um, they're going to have to step up the plate and help solve these people's problems. Some of the problems I'm seeing out there, um, I'm surprised at the number of seniors that are into meth and fentanyl. Um, and that is our new um, aging issue is the use of um, street drugs. So it's going to be um, very um, insightful. The second thing I want to bring your alertness to, it's not on the slide, but it was brought to my attention this week. There is a pile of scams going on, and this is coming from the gambling world. And then the second one is the crypto world, and they're draining people's bank accounts out to zero, and the money is outside our country. 
any seniors are falling trapped to this stuff. So keep your eye out for anybody that's talking about crypto or um, online gambling. There, uh, it could be a real financial disaster for that person. All right, so again, the health department is um, on top of this. Um, Francille is going through the statues and the regs, that's her specialty. And then they're uh, kind of putting it out. But the thing that I was really upset when this legislation went through that we fought tooth and toenail about was the terminology throw residents out. It's in the middle of the bill. So if you want to see the bill, go over to colorado.gov forward slash legislation, look under bills for last year, it's 22154. The next meeting um, with the department is the 27th. If you can find the time and attend, please do so. Um, it, the more voice we have down there um, and the more problem solving we have, the better. All right, we have a second legislation that we're on top of and that's Senate Bill 22. When, um, 122, and this is dementia training for all. So again, testified against it that it was um, that we have we are assuming that everybody that lives in assisted living has dementia, which is not true. Um, and so again, we're training staff um, on dementia, and we should probably be using that time to use mental health first aid and cognitive skill training and other kind of TBI training, other kinds of things, because not everybody suffers from dementia. I don't have a problem with an early class, um, actually have um, developed one. I do have a problem with spending a whole lot of hours on something that may not meet, we need for that particular facility. So we're gonna be in the middle of this one. All right, so I said there is a pile of certifications that are on your plate, and these are the things you need to have in control by the end of this year, because you won't have any time in the beginning of the year to do any of this. So you need to make sure you have an activity um, certification and, and resident engagement. For those of you that are on PTP, you um, may have gotten that notice that on March something or another, if you don't have all your dots um, dotted and your T's crossed with the PTP folks down at HIPPUF, they will cut off your Medicaid and it'll be really hard to get back on. And you have to put notice out that you are not in compliance as of like now. And then you have to um, talk to your residents about why you're out of compliance. So they're really putting a hard onus on this. This was due two years ago. So they gave us time um, for COVID, but the time is over. So I am talking to people and helping them with their PTPs and talking it out um, and getting ideas from all of us, throwing in ideas about how to handle different flags and how to meet those PTP criteria. Um, your kitchen manager should have the kitchen manager course. And I walk into buildings, I'm seeing a lot of errors in kitchen management, in pantries, in glove use, in not having aprons on, not having, if people have long hair, they have to wear headgear and not being masked if we're in sustainable or higher. Um, and they have to wear masks just like the direct care workers. Um, so at any rate, um, we need um, the kitchen folks, somebody in kitchen services to take that course and take lead in it and be able to educate by train the trainer type concept. Um, it's required that one of you, either yourself or a staff person, has the infection control manager role and monitors EM resource and all the noise coming out from the feds, the state, the health department, CMS, OSHA, and keep all that together. I'm gonna to talk about that again in a little bit. And then you need a quality management leader and it does not, again, have to be you. Actually, it'd be better if it's a staff person that gives them ownership and feels like they're part of the company. And then if you're in memory care, um, you need the specialty training management. Um, there's a lot of ways to get those, and um, there's some cool stuff out there that if you don't know where to go, I've got ideas and ideas that many of you have given to me about where to get that specialty um, I want, to, I want to call it specialty management, but I'm going to call it subject management. Um, and so that you are the train to trainer concept. And then person centered care. So I'm, I'm doing the first person centered care outreach for the I 76 corridor. And well, almost everybody up that corridor has um, wanted to um, attend that and have their staff attend it. And so that's coming up in about two weeks. And then I will start hitting the other parts of the state. 
The reason I'm breaking it up in sectors of the state is we take care of different people. And what person center is not for we Colorado, though the base of it is about we Colorado, but we also have to meet our communities and where our communities are at and their attitudes and aging, politics, um, engagement, what their aid you of know, schools, families. And so I've decided to break it up in sectors. And then I will reach out to those sectors and start offering this course. And my goal is to keep it really cheap. And then two is I'll give you a certification for your, every team member that attends it. They'll email me. I'll send them a competency thing that they'll send back to me. I'll give them the certificate. It'll be good for all of 23. And that's one of your major requirements in PTP is to have this person-centered training. All right, um, news alert. So this started last week. Um, state in their surveyors have told the surveyors to check for face-to-face -face CPR first aid training and that the online course is not meeting the needs. The best I could get out of the health department is something happened at some facility and there was a death and the worker told the state they didn't know how to do CPR and it just enveloped from there. That's the best that I know. So um, what I looked at, and other people helped me look at it as well, is that I think the CPR Heart Saver course for those of the people that are not even started is a good place to start. And then you can schedule the face-to-face -face and get that done. And then they'll get a regular first aid CPR card that's good for one or two years, depending on which agency they go with. So Red Cross is definitely two years. American Health, I believe is still one. Um, the state wanted us to use an OSHA course. I looked at it. It's not for our industry. It's for manufacturing, uh, meat plants, grocery stores, that type of thing. And it really doesn't talk about delivering services to older adults. So it's not my recommendation. Um, but the other two, um, I, in there, what I looked at and what they're doing, I think is fine. If we can figure out in sectors to get some um, nurses or um, some sort of health professional to become a certified CPR instructor again, um, God, would that be a blessing? Maybe we could get caught up faster. The other thing is please check your first aid kits. Um, they're probably pretty ragged and they're not meeting the criteria. So remember, if you have multiple floors, you have to have a first aid, one, a minimum of one first aid per floor. And then I went and looked for the red bag and what the right word is on Amazon, and they call it mouth to mouth resuscitation barrier. And the red bag one is the one that the um, American Red Cross um, advocates. And um, so they come, I think you get six or nine of them um, for a price. And so I was looking at the method and the new ones and they've got a lantern on them that you can actually put on the keys to the med cart or they could wear around, um, you know, on a lantern um, and they could put that on the med cart for fast um, access. So, and then there's one time use. And so once you open the bag, it's contaminated. You can't put it back in the bag and use it, okay? So make sure that you um, tell the staff that you do not open it unless you actually need this thing and you wanna use it. We don't know right now, um, really with these little mini outbreaks, we're seeing uh, code um, five, BA5, and they're outbreaking all over this country and they're lasting three or four days. Some people don't have any symptoms at all. Some people have a light headache. Some people might cough. If, or if I have a light fever like 99 and that's it and then it goes away, um, but it's causing havoc. Um, but you don't want to take the chance that somebody could have a BA5 and then you get the big blowout of COVID, which um, is still um, happening. And it's happening in Denver. We had um, 108 in the hospital day before yesterday. Um, it was interesting of that 108 that had a secondary COVID diagnosis, not a primary, none of them were vaccinated. So, you know, we're still not quite where we need to be. Um, if you have an AED in your community, I recommend you get rid of it. Grocery stores and everybody have pulled them. There has been some lawsuits of not, of not using them correctly. EMS is trained to those darn things. They have the right equipment that's kept current and it's just not worth the liability issues to have an AED in your house. Okay, all right. So it looks like by the 15th, we might have some new guidances. I've seen some rumbling at the federal level and that um, 
facilities, uh, nursing homes, the facilities especially that are fully vaccinated are going to be given a waiver about wearing um, N95s. And then it'll be up to the facility about the blue mask um, program again, and then residents wearing masks when they're out in the community. So we should know something approximately by the 15th. All right, so I went to the IDR meeting. Um, that was super sad. Um, the two facilities that were protesting um, didn't have the right wheel, wasn't using the right tool for deciding what level they're at. And then the second part of it, they had a way heavy religious exemptions and they got zero love, zero pass, pay the fines, they're doing 24 hours and we'll be out to see you again in a few days. And so um, where's your policies? Where's your OSHA, OSHA testing? Are you meeting all the criteria? The other thing I discovered while we were playing around with this IDR stuff is how many facilities have counterfeit masks. If they don't have the NOSHA stamp on them, which I will show you, that's what they look like. Um, if they don't have that stamp, then you cannot use them. And I know they cost a ton of money. Um, and you cannot reuse them and staff can't go outside and have a smoke and bring and put them down around their chin and come back in the house. You've got to treat these masks like kit gloves. So one of the facilities out, they had this one with a little vent on the bottom. So I went and did some research to make sure that people weren't going to have a meltdown about them. And I really think they're kind of cool. And so you can breathe a little better and they don't fog up your glasses as bad. And then this one by 3M has a double and a chin comes up and goes around the chin. And um, this particular NOSH stamps that you see right here, the NOSH, um, uh, people are saying this one is a little more comfortable than the blue ones or the black ones down here. So this is some, so check your mask, make sure you didn't accidentally buy counterfeits and make sure that you um, got the right one. Now, right now we are not relieved from getting fit testing. Fit testing is expensive. And we started out with um, a occupational health group in a couple of areas in the state. And then all of a sudden they said they just didn't have capacity to help. So right now, if anybody's got an idea um, in your area, how to get the fit testing done, we'll share it to all the facilities in your area because um, this is still a problem that has not been resolved. All right, same thing with gowns. Um, make sure that you've got gowns. Make sure your staff have had recent test um, training and taking them on, taking them off. Do not go outside the room with it. Do not go outside the facility with the darn thing on. Do not take them home and then wear them back to work. Um, all of these um, situations I've seen, um, got to use them in the room for that client. Now, what you can do um, for that one staff person for that day for that client is if you are got somebody in quarantine, is then you can take them off, off them, and you can turn them outside and hang them on a hook, and you can do that um, for the shift for that one staff person. Multiple staff people cannot wear the same gown. On washable gowns, I like them still. Um, we have not been told we can't use washable gowns, but you, uh, they come off in the room, they go in a laundry bag, and then they go into the laundry. If you have somebody that's sick, somebody that's running a fever, 101, 102, there is some new bags, they're made out of cellulose. And so you can put the, use those bags in that room and put all the linen in that bag and you throw the whole bag in the washer. Therefore, you decrease your risk of spreading COVID or any other um, infection around like norovirus or C. diff. And the bag dissolves in the wash in the hot water and then um, finishes washing. And then you've got clean product and you've decreased the risk to your staff. All right, eye protection, other big hang up all over the freaking place. So you have to work a lot of eye protection. They have to have this thing around the side. All right, so don't forget if you're using this kind, if you're doing glasses, you can still wear the um, face drop shield with the headband, but you must wear the mask underneath. That is not a replacement for mask. I've seen that also. So um, again, cleaning, training, and all of these YouTube videos that are on CDC, on OSHA, and on the health department, you don't have to invent the wheel, use what's out there and just keep showing people until they get this new skill. 
All right. So um, again, some more political noise. Um, you know, COVID is gone pandemically only for the financial picture against the states. So in the federal meeting this morning, they was asked point blankly, what's the last dead drop date that you're going to give the state money for COVID? And they skirted around that issue. Um, what we've heard from some other entities is it will be in January, probably mid-January between the 11th and the 15th. And then the states that need to have a plan of how they're going to function and how they're going to pay for things that the feds have been paying for. So, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, it is also time to look at your renewal for liability insurance. I have talked to two carriers and two vendors here in Denver in the last 30 days and um, what they and how rates are going to look for next season. And it will all depend on they're reviewing your um, portals and they're reviewing what the state has posted on you and your recovery. And it will depend on also um, your rates. So make sure that one, you have to have liability insurance and two is that you're doing everything you can to keep that down so that you don't get creamed. Some of the facilities have been asked for a sexual assault policy. So I wrote, I wrote one with one of the vendors and developed an intake sheet. So if you get asked for that, I have it and you're welcome to it. Um, you know, just let me know and I'll send you both forms. There, uh, that particular company, Transamerica, loved it and we didn't make any adjustments to it. And they wrote the policy for that new home with um, no hassle. All right, so just a few things, okay? These are the things that I'm seeing where facilities are out of order. Um, EM resource, I don't know why people are still having trouble with EM resource. There's some new fields on there. One of them is your vaccine plan, is it updated? The second one is your vaccine clinic that are due is due now. And the third one is your vaccine training for staff and residents. That's where I'm seeing the holes. I don't understand why people are still struggling with this. Glad to help, glad to talk. If you do any training, either use something you have, you may have the one I have, but you need signature, and that is called attestation. When you have a signature, that um, employee is held accountable. So when, when the state comes in, and employees say, I've never been trained to that. I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have any policies on that. And you go, whoa, stop. Here's the policy. They've signed it. Here is the training. They've signed it. Here's their competency. It's signed by both of us. Then they have to backpedal. I, I don't know why staff are throwing agencies under the bus. I'm not, I don't quite understand all of that yet. Um, but I've done a video on our um, YouTube channel, Colorado Gerontological Society, called Stop. Um, because I noticed in all the POCs I was helping with, the first 10 words on the, P on the surveyor was the staff said, I don't know. The administrator said, I don't know. So I'm, we're trying, I'm trying to put a big hole in that and blow that up. And we're going to borrow Colorado language. And when they don't know, because they'll never say that, they'll say, that's a good question. And what I can do for you is this or that. Or yes, I'm glad you asked that question. Let me show you what we do do. And so try everything you can not to use the three words, I don't know, because the surveyors are recording it and they're putting it in the um, survey results. All right, EM resource. Um, when your clinics are set up, I think you can go back to twice a month in EM resource. They're just asking you to do it weekly until you have a clinic. I am tracking down Belovit. I want it for myself. Um, I took um, Pfizer th uh, through everything else and in the last dose made me kind of icky and I don't want to feel that way again. And I know I can't take Moderna. Um, so I'm trying to find out if I can take the Belovit. And what the epidemiology people have told me is that people that have Belovit should be good for a year. It also can be given with a flu shot. And so you can get one shot get both done and be out of this um, booster stuff for, until next fall. So I'm looking for it. I haven't quite figured it out, but if any of you have had success of using this particular vaccine, please let me know. All right, so 
where are we going for next year for vaccinations? Right now, what's on the table is shingles is really needs to be caught up. It's we're having major chicken pox outbreaks all over the country, and shingles is in the same family. Shingles shots will be free as I think February 1 instead of $300 or 199 depending on your insurance. So we're going to do a major push for catching up shingles in the spring. Okay. And then doctors who are contracting with insurance plans have, um, they, to get the insurance plan to reimburse them, they're going to have to step up for the vaccination world and including Rocky Mountain Primary Care, those kinds of types of folks. So I'll be working on that in November and December and I'll, in the next, um, Thing that I do, I'll give a catch up of where I'm at on that part. So remember vaccines is part of Medicare Part D and that's the drug plan. And all of your residents should have be on the D, whether the state pays the bills or whether the consumer does. But we want to, and we're heading for open enrollment, starts October 15th. And so it's one of our big initiatives for three weeks is we'll be doing a lot of Medicare work. If you have any families or you've got somebody that is not eligible for the state to pay to be in your facility and has a fairly large drug list, if that family wants to, they can contact me. I have pharmacology students from university going to help me. And uh, the goal is to get people off of meds, not add meds, or get them on the right meds for the situation. So it's free to the whole state, we're, we're not charging anything for it. And they just watch our website or contact me um, and they can contact Eileen if they can't get a hold of me. Um, and we're glad to look at anybody in your facilities on uh, medications that they're paying out of, uh, they're paying for. All right. Um, if you're licensed for PACE beds, remember you still um, have to meet all the qualifiers under PTP. And so PTP is being cleaned up right now. I've got four or five people across the state that I'm helping with their PTP noise and just fine tuning it and verbiage, giving verbiage back to what Colorado wants to hear. So the big things is house rules got to be really minimal, four or five house rules. Okay, very, very minimal, minimal, minimal. And if you got your mother's voice out in your house rules, throw it in the trash and get rid of it. Okay. Second one is resident rights. Only use what's in chapter seven. If you want a pretty copy, uh, let me know. I'll send you my pretty copy. And all you got to do is I recommend you blow it up to at least legal size paper or poster size if possible over at Office Depot and post it and make sure in your next resident meeting, you give a copy and you put a copy on everybody's back door. Um, that has worked really well and then all the facilities I can get them to do that. And then the state sees that you're serious about uh, honoring resident rights. They know where they are. You can refer your residents to their rights at any time and the ombudsman can help you with this conversation. And then care coordination for anything. Um, that is a responsibility under chapter seven, no matter how people pay you. All right, so next week, I'm gonna be really busy. We are working um, and um, going through um, federal training and then um, to help uh, and all the people that call us on Medicare open enrollment. So formularies are changing a tad. We'll know more by Monday. We're gonna run some test cases, but I'm very interested in some um, noise around insulin. So we think we've got it. So people that draw their own insulin up, the insulin in the bottle is under part D. The syringes and the wipes are either private pay or if their pharmacy or doctor has the ability to fill Part B, then they do a shared cost. But those are the, the right now, the syringes and the alcohol wipes, the test strips are not covered under Part D, okay? And then we have um, several um, inhalers that I'll be um, figuring out next week. And then um, the typical asthma, blood pressure meds, cardiac meds, and what it's going to cost people and how fast they're going to hit the donut hole, which is when they spend their wad of money for the year. And I always have three or four 
um, seniors that come to me, they spend their whole budget in January for the whole year. Then they have to pay privately for quite a while. And then when they spend the next wad of money, then the feds pick up a shared program. So we're still cleaning it up. When we do open enrollment starting the 15th, we'll have it down. And um, if you guys wanna take our Medicare class, sign up, it's free. It'll help you understand better because families get really freaked out when, and, and people that are on SSI, SSDI, that the feds have put in B and D, they're a little bit shell-shocked when they get a bill from the pharmacy. They shouldn't be getting a bill from the pharmacy. The problem is they fell off of LIS, low income subsidy. It's really simple. I can get them right back on. Um, it's a 15 minute activity, but that's what we have figured out last year. And I'm starting to see it again this year is if they moved and changed their address with social security, social security sent something in the mail and it went back as undeliverable, they kick them off of LIS. And so we can, we can fix it. It's just how the country is um, going to survive. Um, we have about 50 million people on Part D in the country. All right. And then um, the Part D premium for people on private pay is going to be somewhere around $31 a month. If they're in an Advantage plan, the Advantage plan might absorb that and not pay for it. But the people that do standalone, that's going to be about the average for the plan. And then people that are on the home and community-based service dollars in your communities and you're billing the state for their care, they should be in the LIS program. And once they get a bill from the pharmacy, then it's a pretty good clue to me that they fell off and we need to fix it. All right, so we're working on more legislation and watch our YouTube channel. Eileen's gonna drop several things and some real reports in there. And she will um, try to help educate the seniors. The big message that we try to get out every year is if it's on TV, it's not free. You have to really decide if you wanna spend the money on it because um, one way or another it's gonna cost you. And it, may, and it may not be totally vetted out. So I hate the TV pharmacy ads. And I really try to talk people into using tried and true medications over the what's sexy and what's glamorous that's on television. All right, other thing that, um, this is the other place you gotta put some energy into. So we took everything that was kind of floating all over the place and we put it in one bucket and it's our Emergency Preparedness Action Plan. It has three parts. Part one, you've been doing for 18 months, probably got a little cleanup, little attestation, little bit of um, make sure you're, everything's pristine and that you're on top of it and that's your COVID infection control. Where you probably need to catch up with your staff is to do some retraining in norovirus, West Nile, and C. diff, especially C. diff, because that is actually active right now in the state. Then you need a second notebook or a second piece of your plan, which is the fire and safety and plant management. There's been some additions that I'll go over in a hot minute. And then you got to start figuring out an evacuation plan for 72 hours. Again, we put this on the shelf. We were working on it. We shelved it. And I can just tell you right now that the assisted livings and nursing homes in Florida under these floodwaters um, will bring out more of success and failures. And the hospital, several hospitals um, moved all their residents to third and fourth floors because their first and second floors were totally flooded out with 12 feet of water. And their problem was they couldn't leave the hospital um, to get supplies or to get staff in or out. And so again, things will come out of this that really is gonna push this emergency evacuation for 72 hour noise. And this, Part of it, I hope you have done, and part of it clean up, because I'd like you to have the most of all of this stuff done before the end of October so that you can enjoy your residents, your families, and calm down a little bit so you're ready in January for the next um, push. So fire safety updates. Um, there's a $500 fee every year for certificate of occupancy, you must have a receipt for that $500 that goes to your local fire department, okay? There's a new form 
um, that the state put out in July that you can attach to your current fire drill form. And it comes from the school district. Don't get rattled because it says school on it. Don't worry about that. Take the parts that are useful to you, attach it to your current um, drill and just fill it out. What they're looking for is risk management issues. And so it's not hard to do, It'll take you another couple of minutes, but don't reinvent the wheel. And then you need to have a quarterly risk assessment tool. This is an old tool that came back and they want to know who in your building is the most vulnerable, who's going to need the most help, and where should the fire department go first. So your fire safety map by your panel um, is a must. And a lot of those need some updating. And then the fire panel being in good working order and locked and not tampered with by residents and street people. And then the third thing is to have all your forms and then make sure you've got your minimum of six drills, successful drills, because that's the terminology. They have to be successful under four to five minutes or less. And if they're not successful, you have to run other drills until you can reach that point of success and figure out how to do that. The other thing they're looking at is exit signs. There's still paper exit signs in buildings. They haven't been approved for over a decade. You must have an electronic lighted exit sign. Um, there's battery operated ones that you change the battery along like you would your house alarm system, um, or you can have them wired in. But the paper exit signs are no longer acceptable and those will um, get a tag. And then a robust safety program for smokers. So this is my other headache, especially in the memory or in the behavioral health side. Um, so we're still um, struggling. Um, across the state with people um, not adhering to the federal and state regulation of that they have to be 25 feet or in some municipalities 15 um, from the building entrance and you must have a smoking center. Where you're gonna get hassled if you allow smoking on your facility is it's going to have to be sheltered for the winter and that it has to be snow free for residents to get to it. So you need to think about this. Um, I have been at some facilities and um, they didn't have the fire waste baskets in, outside or inside. Make sure that you've got the appropriate ones. It will say fire resistant on the bottom. There's a stamp and the department will turn those over. And if it's, it doesn't have the right stamp, tag. Okay. And then figuring out how you're going to get your residents to cooperate. And, you're, and I'll tell you, your other enemy is your staff that smoke. And, I, and again, they violate masks, they, vi they wear gowns out, they light cigarettes from their cigarette to a, a resident cigarette. Um, it is, we are nowhere close to having this problem solved. All right, on the evacuation side, this is something your night staff can do for you. You need what I call a master sleeve. I like using those plastic sleeves with the three holes that you can put in a notebook. And that's the stuff you need to have a copy in and then um, cloud space and have it in the cloud so that um, it's easy to get to if you have to evacuate. So this is your master sleeve. And then once a quarter, check uh, catch up your medication list, make sure it's current. And then the rest generally doesn't change any. And then the right room. So the fire department, one of the tags I saw just recently, um, residents were moved and it wasn't current on the fire plan of where that resident was. So like I said, make sure that your master sleeve has the right room on it. Make sure your fire plan um, that you have not in the public view, but you have for the fire department is got the um, residents names and they're in the right space. So pencil it is. All right, does each of your resident have a go pack? So go packs were really popular about five years ago. We were doing them out of pillowcases and then quilt clubs were making go packs as well. And so there's a brochure available, and I'm glad to share that with you if you don't own it already, what goes in a go pack for each resident. And then you must have a community duffel bag 
on wheels, recommended highly. And you need to have your, a first aid kit in there. I would use an older one and put some additional stuff in there in plastic bags, extra gloves, um, face shields, extra mask in all three sizes, and an extra charger for your telephone. And then a portable battery for cell phones that you can charge rapidly. Because um, remember that in the regs, your landline is for your residents. You must have a cell phone that's an emergency backup cell phone for the business. And so um, you, you cannot use your a personal cell phone or ask your staff to use cell phones. So uh, sometimes, sometimes that I've seen on that um, because people are taking shortcuts. And then an infection control kit um, would be really useful to have two or three with gowns, masks, gloves, face shield, and um, so that just in case something goes wrong or somebody spikes a temp, and I didn't put it on here, but I should have thermometer. Um, and that's working, a working thermometer. All right, so in summary, please recognize, and I applaud each of you that are here today, your role's hard. There is nothing easy about the work you do, and we're grateful for the work you do. And it may not feel like it all the time, especially because people seem to be fussing at you all the time. Um, but if you can get some of this stuff done and make a commitment, get it done so you can enjoy the holiday season, um, more of a normal community um, that will help you heal and feel better. And then we will take it up in January. So my intention is I will tape and drop and we will notify everybody that it's in and I'll do it right, probably right before Thanksgiving. And you can watch it where you're at. Some of it will be old news. Some of it will, um, anything new that drops my way, I'll put in there. And that will be available um, uh, in our YouTube channel for you to get. I'm also um, doing two other programs that will be in our YouTube channel. And like I said, you'll get notification when we put those in that they're available to you because you're a part of our society. And then in January, um, by then I hope to figure out what, what um, how to be helpful and to make it meaningful for you guys so that you feel like um, somebody hears you and that you're listening. Our next um, administrator course is the last, um, starts the last week of January and it's two days a week for three weeks. And what else are we doing? Um, I think um, that's pretty much where we are. So um, I'm, we've got a couple of minutes. I can answer any questions if you want to ask anything. And then you'll get a copy of these slides and then email address, call me, talk to me. Um, you know, all you got to do is pick it up and say, this is what I need or this is what I'm looking for so that um, you can get caught up and feel like you're on top of things. So any questions from any of you guys that are here? Hi, Pat, this is Janelle. Um, I had put it in Hi, the Janelle. chat, but I'm just going to ask you, when you're talking about the kitchen manager, is that the same as the food safety or is that a whole separate training? I'm, I'm sorry, Janelle, I missed the first part of that. Um, you were talking about having a kitchen manager. Yeah, that's a separate training. The best ones, Janelle, Denver Health and Pueblo Health has the best ones. They're about 30 minutes. Um, and frankly, when I took it the first time around, I just took it to see what they were offering. I changed what I do in my personal kitchen. So I rearranged my personal kitchen based off their recommendations and I totally rearranged my refrigerator and I don't get spoiled food anymore. Um, and so it's, um, it's really cool. It's not a bad class. It's not to be mean. It's really good, helpful hints of, be, of how to do your pantry, how to do your refrigerator, how to store, um, leftovers, how to mark things, how to mark your pantry so that you're rotating foods. Um, and it's just good reminders. And then you know that all your staff, um, no matter whether, whether they're in the kitchen or not, have to have the food safety class as part of their orientation in the first 30 days. Is that going to be in reg? The kitchen it is manager? Reg. It's already in reg. It is. Do you know where in the regs? Oh, sure. Oh, it's OSHA. It's not in chapter seven or chapter It will two. be, but it's in OSHA already. Okay. All righty. Okay, and thanks. Especially, Janelle, for those homes that are bigger than um, 10. Okay, it's for homes bigger than 10. Yeah, so in seven, it talks okay. about the commercial kitchen. Um, right. noise, and then it refers to OSHA. And if you go over to OSHA, it's in there. Okay, so then any if you're less than 10, 
then you don't have to have a kitchen manager. It not in this residence class. Because again, you will learn a lot about how to manage your kitchen better. You'll decrease your cost and decrease your waste. Okay, great. All right, thanks. Wonderful Scott. class, Janelle. It's not a mean class at all. Was no, no. I'm just wondering. I, I'm just. I'm just want, wanting to make sure that when I'm dealing with facilities, that I'm giving them the right guidelines. You know that. You know. I mean, I think it's probably a good class, but when I'm consulting and dealing with facilities, I want to, you know, be giving them the right information about the kitchen manager. Um, guidelines. All right. Well, let me um, give you a crosswalk. So 6.8 administrator oversight. And if things are going wrong in the kitchen or you have a, a CTF or a norovirus outbreak, they're going to cite 6.8. And then the that little thing that's just a few words um, in following OSHA and following OSHA. And remember, OSHA is in our business. We're not going to get rid of them. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other questions? All right. Um, so if you are willing to stay with memory care, um, I'd like you to put your camera on. Um, and the rest of you, thank you for coming and look forward to talking to you before the holidays is over. Hi, Dee. Hi. Hey, Ray. Hey, Pat. Hey, Janelle. So I think the people that wants to stay is here. So I wanted to start a, a separate circle for memory care because I think that's where we're going to see the majority of change in the next season and the big push of what it's going to look like, what they're going to tolerate. And then again, the political and the financial, uh, you know, the nursing homes trying to decide what they want to do. And then you've got your big companies that do, you know, memory care for the whole building. And oh my God, they've been under such fire for the last month, few months. Um, and so I, I just think it's, you know, time that we get, we join hands and work on this together. So I made a list of, um, things that I think is important to talk about and that I'd like to get this started in January. Um, one of them, as I said before, and Ray, I, I did put one in the mail, mail to you. Um, and Jason, I'm going to put this one in the mail to you. But this whole okay. questioning capacity um, is going to be super important, how we handle this capacity thing, because this is legal. And now that it's national noise, it's even more legal. So for any of you um, that will help um, look at this and help gather information, we can pass it on. I do have a really cool tool that was built in New Hampshire called the Fast Form. I've been using it for residents that we needed to go get guardianships on, and the courts love it. And so it's a combination tool, a, scan, a SCUM, and then cognitive assessment, and then safety, and that, and it's all in one tool. And so it's pretty cool. The cool thing about in doctor's offices, when they do the um, memory testing, the residents memorize the questions and the answers. And then they, and then they doctors say, oh, your memory's just fine. Well, that's so false. And so again, they're at their best when they're at the doctor's office and you see their worst at their house, at your house. And so this, so when I've been in these interesting battles um, and then working with families and then going to probate court and presented this tool done by a neuropsychiatrist, um, the court just awarded the guardianship and I didn't have, we didn't have any problems at all. And then the, take the class and we were um, good to go. So this is one of my primary worries because we've got, because of the civil rights protection that is so very, very important um, and is national um, and international is protecting civil rights. And you're hearing it in all kinds of ways, women's rights, kids' rights, schools' rights, um, transportation's rights, airplanes, stewardesses. I mean, if you really pay attention to the news, a lot of the noise going on is rights protection. So that's one of the things I'd really like to tackle in January. And then what forms do we need? Um, what training are we going to need to get our staff engaged? So somebody asked me yesterday, what can you do so that the staff stay, they don't quit, and they feel like, uh, and they feel like they're part of the family again? And I think in memory care, 
and you guys can say yay or nay. Are, is turnover as bad as it is in the general industry? Or are people staying because they really love dementia? Don't all talk at once. Either shake your head, you're having high turnover, or you're not having high turnover. When I was in long-term care, the memory care unit actually did really well with staffing. Um, I think because the staff felt comfortable, it was very home-like um, and they really, it was a smaller community. So they really got to know their residents and I think they felt, um, you know, loyalty to them and, and to show up for work, so. So you might have some things to bring to the table, Danelle, that was positive that we can get into other people's lives. How about some of the rest of you? You guys experiencing high turnover, or no turnover? My no turnover right I'm sorry. Go ahead, Linnell. Mine's been pretty consistent in the memory care, but I have noticed that I have the opportunity to switch them out into the other assisted living and give them a little break from time to time helps. Okay, so that's a tool. Don't in you know make, keep that in your repertoire. Stuff is being able to change it up because it gets boring. Yeah. Okay. Ray, how about you? How's things going, especially off shifts, evening nights? Um, I'm kind of like in a turnover right now. I don't have a, um, I call this uh, two, to, two to 10 um, caregiver right now it's because she's back home in the Philippines. So covering that up until I, she gets back. But anything else, it's been pretty good, I guess. Jason, how about out there on the other side of the state? Pat, for us, it's, it's been somewhat stable. Very good. All right. Well, I'm going to depend on you guys to help um, put some stuff out that we can share with some of the other folks that call me and see if we can help them um, decrease their turnover rates. All right. And then um, the other thing that is we're going to be held to a higher um, accountability is documentation. And so from a pre-admission, admission, legal day-to-day -day documentation and discharge documentation is gonna get tighter. Um, so one of the things that I'd like you to do and think about between now and January, what's working in your facility? What do you need? What do we need to build uh, for the industry? And, um, what, and could we get it electronic? So I've like looking at the, um, looking at um, the Mars, and could we actually expand Mars and make it all electronic checkboxes? So that day-to-day -day, um, documentation is less hassle. And then do very little handwritten except by certain staff because I'm seeing stuff in medical records that is scary as I'll get out. And one the other day um, said, the staff person wrote in there, I think she just hates me. And that's what she wrote in the medical record. So, you know, we still have a problem out there that we need to deal with. And then what, and then how do you communicate to your families and how are you content are your families with your services? Um, the families went to legislators and to the governor's office during the early part of COVID, really yelling and screaming about us not letting them in. So that Senate bill that Eileen's working on is how do we safely have visitors when we have outbreaks of infection issues, whether it's norovirus, C. diff, um, a new COVID strain, a new pandemic. And um, so we're going to have to do a lot of thinking next year. So um, I was wondering, if, so if, am I on track with what I'm thinking about or is there, am I missing the boat? Are you talking about families having more say on visitation rights or? Well, everything, this whole list of stuff that I think that a memory care circle for just memory care, we could be really effective because we could work just on what's in their face. 
because memory care is very different than regular assisted living, it requires different skill sets. So that's why I've been trying to decide or figure out if it'd be worth putting this group together. I think in we had a recent meeting with legislatives and they were kind of, it was kind of eye-opening to them that they didn't realize the restrictions we still have in place. Mm -hmm. They're kind of out there living their world and they didn't have any idea that nursing homes and assisted livings are still held to this high standard of isolation and mask use and eye protection and all that other fun stuff and gathering as big groups and doors still locked so it was eye-opening to them so hopefully that makes some changes if we keep speaking up to them and so Linella, what is it worth building an alr circle for memory care i think it is yeah I think it's always good to network with others and share our knowledge and experiences and troubleshoot together. And Jason, you said you'd help. Yeah, I would participate and assist. Okay, Natasha, can how about you? You're on mute. Or you're not there at all. I'm not sure which. All right. So Jennifer, you don't do memory care per se, though there is a um, you have some of your clients that have dementia issues. So would you be interested in being a part of this group? It's like talking to my grandkids and getting ghosted. <laughs> it cracks me up. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, continue to build on this idea. I don't want to start it until after Christmas. I want to catch everybody catch up on all the uh, other garbage and make sure you're there. And then um, I'll send it out and say, you know, and we'll start an ALR circle just for memory care and continue to list the stuff that we need to work on or talk about and, and help the industry um, be really, really successful. Because like I said, I, you know, everything that we're seeing from the federal level on down, we're going to have some major, major changes in memory care coming up in the next 24 months and what it's going to look like, how we're going to do it. How do we cope with the people in the community that are severely um, impaired with dementia? And there's a bunch of them. How do we deal with um, those that have behavioral health issues and dementia? Um, we're going to have to deal with all that too. So if you have any bright or brawny ideas you think would be useful, please email them to me. All right. This was the other stuff I was thinking about. And um, so one of the things that the noise on the federal level is having dedicated staff. So like Ray, like you're a CNA too, and there is talk of developing, a, it's called a behavioral um, health um, assistant in one and two. And so Colorado is actually looking very closely at that. And I think it's coming. Um, and the, the level two people would be ex subject matter experts in dementia care. It will cost the state more money and it'll cost us more money because um, again, it'll be a professional. It's not considered to be licensed at the moment, though that could come down the line, it'd be equal to an LVN if it goes into a licensure. So that is some other stuff that I wanna put on people's radar. And these just other topics that I was thinking about when I put this together is how do we get community engagement? How do we do age friendly? How do we, you know, what else can we do? So if you aren't aware of DementiaFriendsUSA.org, they are gonna be the national certification agency. They have made a contract with the feds. Please look at their website, it's pretty cool. They got some cool stuff. And then, like I said, for those of you that I haven't mailed it out already and you want it, I'll give you the um, copy of capacity because it was very eye-opening of what um, the noise is above us and what they're thinking about. And now, you know, feeling like they are going to take charge and tell us how to handle everything. And then how are we going to communicate to families that a DPOA is probably not going to work in our industry much longer. 
And so we'll have to um, start figuring out that story. We don't have any answers, I can tell you that. And so this is a list of some of the national conversations and, um, and what is out there already. And I'm keeping track of these as I attend things. And just to, so I don't forget, um, what the what the verbiage is out there. If any of you that um, don't use Tifa Snow in your training tools, please do. She's cool, and she just opened a nonprofit foundation for dementia management. So she took her money that she's earned and turned it into a nonprofit. Um, so Tifa Snow has a lot of great trainings. All right, and so that's what I have for you guys that I wanted to talk to you about. And like I said, trying to figure out if it. Um, get this thing going and so we'll we'll launch it in january i pr i'm thinking about having it on a separate day and not attached to the regular alr noise and what i may do is just do this live and do my updates and just put them into our youtube channel and that may be how um, to handle it for a while so i'll be asking you guys for feedback if you will come and if you'll be a part of um, these discussion points and help Thank you, Pat. I appreciate it. You're welcome to know. Um, Linnell, I sent you an email and I also left you a voicemail and oh. you didn't respond. Oh, I did not get a voicemail. And no, I not Danell, Linnell. Oh, sorry. It's okay. I, don't I actually did either, send you so. an email, Danell. <laughs> but no, it was Linnell that I was trying to catch up with. Oh, yeah, I don't recall getting one from you, so All right. I'll have well, to check. I, you, I left a voicemail on you guys' phone, and then um, I sent you an email because I'm going to do that um, person-centered care required state training for HCBS. Okay. And so uh, it's on Zoom. And if you guys want to be a part, it's for, particularly for the 76 corridor. I wanted to tackle that. I want to do regional training and see what we can do to improve the conversations in regions because we can't do one for the whole state and expect all of the families and all the cultures and all the communities to act the same. That's ridiculous. So I'm breaking it, I'm clustering it, but you guys I'm picking on first because the majority of the facilities down that corridor have contacted me and they need it for PTP anyway. So if you're yeah, I'd be interested, interested. let me know. All right. Does anything ha uh, anybody ha need to bring up anything? Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you coming today. Have a great weekend.